Okay, let's continue our discussion on the definite integral. Remember, we, we defined the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx to equal the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum, i equals 1 to n of the f of x sub i star times delta x. x sub i star can be any x value in the i-th subinterval. We're used to using the right endpoint, in which case x sub i star would be x sub i, but t technically you could use any, uh, any value of x. <clears throat> Uh, the dx, that, that just tells you that you're partitioning the x-axis into subintervals. So it's the x-axis that, that gets broken up into these subintervals. And uh, this, uh, we, we, we define this, uh, this definite integral exists, provide this limit exists, and, and the, for any choice of x of i stars, the, this limit has to give you the same value. If that's true, then we say the definite integral exists and it equals that value. Okay. Uh, let's just practice using the definition here. Uh, express this definite integral as a limit of a Riemann sum where x sub i is the right endpoint of each subinterval. Interval, okay? So um, we first compute delta x. Delta x would be 4 minus 0 over n. And then uh, what would x sub i star be? Since we're using the right end endpoints, x sub i star would be, it's always a plus i delta x, since a is zero, it just becomes i delta x, or 4i over n. So if you just put all that together, the definite integral from zero to four of the square root of x squared plus one dx is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum i equals one to n of f of x sub i star delta x. That becomes the limit as n goes to infinity, the sum i equals one to n of f of x sub i star. So it becomes the square root of four i over n squared plus one times delta x, which is 4 over n. We could probably simplify it, but let's not worry about that right now. Let's do another one. Actually, why don't, why don't you, you do this one? See if you can evaluate, see if you can um, express this definite integral as a uh, limit of a Riemann sum, where again x sub i star is the right endpoint of each subinterval. You first compute delta x, which is b minus a over n, which looks like 3 over n. Then again, you compute x sub i star. Since we're using right endpoints, um, x sub i star is always going to be a or 0 plus i delta x gives you 3i over n. Then all you have to do is, is put it together. The, um, the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 1 over x squared plus 1 dx is this limit, isn't it? So, so for x sub x, for x sub i star, you plug in 3 over i. So you get 1 over 3i over n squared plus 1. This is your f of x sub i star. And then for your delta x, you just put 3 over n. So there you go. Again, we could probably simplify it, but let's not worry about it right now. Okay, let's go backwards now. Okay, let's go backwards now. I'm giving you the, the limit of the Riemann sum, and I want you to express this as a definite integral. Yeah, uh, so you, what you have to do really here is recognize this is your delta x most likely. So delta x is b minus a over n, which looks like 3 over n. Uh, it, uh, there's a good chance a is 0 and b would be 3 then. Let's go with that unless there's a reason other, otherwise. a is 0, b is 3, and this is your delta x. So what would x, what would, um, x sub i star be? It's always a plus i delta x, so it, it becomes 0 plus 3 over n. This, this is your x sub i star right there. So, so the integral would be the integral from 0 to 3, right, of cosine squared of x sub i star, which is, turns into an x, times dx. That's it. Okay, <clears throat> why don't you try this one? See if you can express this one as a uh, definite integral. Let's assume we're using right end, end, end points. So your delta x, b minus a over n, looks like 1 over n. So again, let, let's assume a is 0 and b is 1 for now. So what is your x sub i star? Your x sub i star would be 0 plus i over n. So put it all together, whoops, put it all together, the, the, um, the integral is going to go from 0 to 1, definite integral from 0 to 1. Your, your f of x looks like 1 plus x squared, doesn't it? And then your, this becomes your dx. Nice, huh? Uh, let's do something else. How about this one? 
there's a big hint here. It says, evaluate this integral by interpreting it as an area. Now, your teacher might not be that nice. Your teacher might not say interpret as an area, but um, when they ask you to find the actual value of it, we don't really have many ways to compute the actual value unless it's a very simple one. So, how would you do that? Well, if you let y equal the square root of 4 minus x squared, you square both sides and add x squared to both sides, you realize this is the equation for a circle, isn't it? So if you look at this graphically, this is your circle x squared plus y squared equals 4. I'm looking at the top half of the circle would be the square root of 4 minus x squared, but I'm only looking at it, the area under this function from 0 to 2. So it's just this quarter of the circle is, is what this definite integral represents. So it's 1 fourth the area of a circle, 1, her, 1 fourth of 4 pi, which is just pi. So th this area here is pi, and that's the answer. Okay, let's continue talking about interpreting definite integrals in terms of areas. See if you can try this number 6a by yourself. See if you can express, see if you can compute this by looking at it geometrically, looking at this is area under a curve, 0 to 3 of 1 minus x. My hint is draw a, uh, draw a graph. Okay, so when you sketch a graph, you get this. Uh, I bet this definite integral is going to be negative, because you see this is going to contribute in a positive sense. This is going to be a negative because the, the graph is below the x-axis and you can think of it as, as the uh, the height of each rectangle is negative in that sense. <clears throat> so that, so that you're going to compute the area of this triangle which is one half one times one which is one half. Compute the area of this triangle which is one half two times two which is two but we're going to subtract that area and the net area if you want to think of it that way the definite integral is negative three halves. This one's kind of similar. The way you would do this one if you draw this this graph Notice we get uh, the absolute value of x minus 1 is a horizontal shift to the right one unit. From 0 to 3, we would add these two areas together. The first area, 1 half 1 times 1. The second area is 1 half 2 times 2, so you end up with 5 halves. Nice, huh? Okay, this last thing I want to talk about is really important for what we're going to talk about next sec section. Uh, <clears throat> see, see this function here? This is, this is a function f of t. This is the t-axis. This is the y-axis, this is the t-axis. This function here is a function of x. Think of x as telling you how far along you move along this axis, this t-axis. x would be a fixed point here, like if x equals 1, then this would be g of 1, which would be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t dt. Think of this function g of x as telling you the area under the graph of f of t from 0 to x. I always call it the area so far function. So it is a function of x, right? It depends on how far you go along the t-axis to determine the area. So what is g of 1? g of 1 would be the area under this curve from 0 to 1, which would be the area of this triangle, which is 1 half 1 times 1, which is 1 half. See? What would g of 0 be? g of 0 is the area under the curve from 0 to 0. In other words, delta x is 0 minus 0 over n, so delta x is 0, so uh, the Riemann sum is going to be 0, so the definite integral is 0 as well. So g of 0 is 0. Uh, how about this one? What's g of 4? g of 4 is the area under the graph of this function from 0 to 4. So if you just add these up, what's the, what's the area of the first triangle? That would be 1 half. The area of the second big triangle is actually 1 half 2 times 1, which actually gives you um, negative 1. What's the area of this last triangle from 3 to 4? It would be 1 half also. So if you add up 1 half minus 1 plus 1 half, you get 0, which geometrically makes sense. If you add up these, the area of these triangles where these count negative, it does look like it adds up to 0. All right. Um, Let's do one last thing here. here. Here's a question we're going to look at next section. Where does g have a minimum? I'm not asking where f has a minimum. I'm asking where g has a minimum. Uh, g is the area so far. See what you're doing? You're adding up, you're adding up the area. So g's, g, g's going up. Now here, uh, you're starting to subtract area. So, so g is going down now, right? So this is actually a local max here g is going down and all of a sudden you start adding that more negative area. Now you start adding positive area again so g starts going up again after 3. So at 3 you're going from adding negative area to going adding positive area so g has a turning point there. You have a local min. It's actually an absolute min too, isn't it? 
Anyway, x equal 3. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.